All right, I'm going to go over the rules pretty quickly. Uh, candidates are going to give three minutes to uh, give an introductory remark. Uh, we did a coin toss just before this started, and I believe Miranda's going to go first. Um, once that's completed, we will start with the question period. We had several questions that submitted in advance. And uh, Margo Horner is collecting questions. If anyone has a question that you'd like to ask, uh, candidates will get two minutes to answer each question. Any candidate can uh, rebut for 30 seconds, but uh, the other candidate's response if they so choose. And, and then once you've gone through maybe about 45 minutes of questions, each candidate will get a two-minute uh, closing statement. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to welcome up as candidates and uh, welcome Miranda to give her three-minute introductory remarks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, good morning. I'm Miranda Keller, and I'm running to serve on the Arlington School Board. So I'm going to start by saying why I'm running, and I'm talking about my priorities. Number one, instruction. We have kids in APS who need more right now. Kids who are behind in the building, kids who have the literacy challenges, even if they are moving through our secondary schools, our special populations of English learners and students with disabilities need a rigorous education on par with that of their peers. And we have kids who need more of a challenge, more acceleration, more intensified classes out of EPS. All of those together need to be our priority on the school board in terms of monitoring how we are doing on a regular attending basis, setting appropriate benchmarks, and marking our progress. That's my number one priority. Number two, and probably high for first, is our teachers. This year, we need to support our teachers more than ever. I would bring this year more creativity and more generosity to our substitute school. And I would uh, eliminate an unfair holiday leave party uh, policy that favors our administrators over our teachers. Going forward, I want to focus on competitive benefits and pay, bringing back parental leave, and making sure APS leaves among our regional peers in teacher retreat. Third priority is the budget, which really drives one and two. I will make sure that one and two students and teachers are a priority in our budget. And I will bring oversight, fiscal responsibility during a time of increasingly challenging budget environments. And I would like to bring back an independent audit function so we know we're using our eight hundred million dollars in budget dollars wisely. So those are my local priorities, but I would be remiss if I didn't address state level issues. We have our own values here, and I think it's important to make sure that those are continued even during this administration. So, ADF had the trans a policy to protect our trans students. It was uh, passed and voted on by the school board in 2019. I support it. I think ADF should explore rigorous curriculum, including the AP African American Studies program, uh, course, I mean, uh, in order to teach real history. And I think that to the extent we are talking about learning loss or more dollars for our schools, they need to flow through school provisions and not to be in the form of vouchers. So all of those are my priorities at the local level and the state level, and those are the things I stand for. I want to take a minute to tell you about myself. I am a Green Valley resident. I've lived in Arlington for almost 10 years. I'm involved in the Civic Association on the Executive Board. I am involved in PPAs at two APS schools, and I am an APS parents. I've also run to the school board before and used that to forge ongoing relationships with our elected officials, some of whom are in the room today, and with Dr. Durant. I am ready to serve. I also want to invite this attention if you'd like to learn more to the meeting uh, on Wednesday that some of you may have missed. Uh, we have some printed out uh, bios of me about my work as a lawyer as well. I was introduced by Mike Lieberman and he spoke to that. And feel free to pick one up. Thank you. Good morning, Arlington County Democrats. I am so glad to be here this morning. And if you come to Bus Boys and Poets in Sherlington on any given second Saturday, or in this case, third Saturday, um, you are in Kashiro country, and I'm glad to be on some turf today. My name is Angelo Kashiro, and I am running for the Arlington County School Board in this year, 2023. Um, uh, 
The truth of the matter, folks, is um, as we emerge from this pandemic, our students and our schools are at the epicenter of multiple swelling crises. From the crisis in student mental health, the teachers that are overworked, underpaid, burnt out, micromanaged, and flat out disrespected. From the impending hunger cliff from the end of federal pandemic aid, like expanded Medicaid, expanded food stamps, free school meals, and the Biden Harris child tax credit. As well as Arlington is on the front of ongoing and insidious attacks on trans youth and Black history by the MAGA governor we have in Richmond. We have a lot of challenges. And the truth of the matter, my friends, is that standing up for students, teachers, and public schools is what I've always done and what I do best. I stood up for students when I got 100% of my graduating senior class registered to vote. Despite the fact that nationwide, two and five, 18 to 24 year olds, are not registered to vote. I stood up for students when I organized a walkout at my school after the mass shooting at Marjorie Stillman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I stood up for teachers when I was in high school. As many of you know, I split my time growing up between Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, and Culpeper here in Virginia. When I stood up on the picket lines of the West Virginia Teacher Strike my senior year of high school, where we formed the Students for Teachers Coalition. In a very abrupt fashion, stood by them. And uh, furthermore, I've advocated for our APS students on the School Health Advisory Board, the Early Childhood Advisory Committee, as well as the County Food Security Coalition, where I work on issues like this. I will advocate in the very same fashion on the school board on priorities like preschool meals to address the impending hunger threat. I will advocate for 12 weeks of paid family leave in line with the Democratic agenda to support our teachers. I will advocate for structural change to empower the student voice, such as putting a student representative on the school board. I call him a student advocate in line with all of our neighboring jurisdictions. Arlington stands alone and not all. I think we ought to lead the way first, not last. I'm asking for your vote in this campaign, and it's a simple proposition I'm asking you to accept. It's the idea that if we're to address the most precarious moment for public education in a generation, this generation of youth ought to be at the table. I'm asking you to vote for the perspective we need at the table. I'm asking you to vote to bring people together, never divide folks apart. And I'm asking you to vote for the change that's a Thank you. All right. All right, thank you, candidates. I'm going to stick to this one. It sounds like the volume is up a little bit better. We'll remind candidates to speak as close to this uh, microphone as you can for our recording audience who will be able to see this event a little bit later on. Uh, I am slightly remiss, but I only acknowledge that someone else in the house, Jenny Diamond, is with us today. Jenny, from the other day, we thank you for coming to the community. Also, our school employee, uh, neighbor representative, president is with us today. Thank you so much for being here as well. All right. And once again, I'm running to candidates, uh, two minute responses, and if the need arises, we have 30 seconds to move up. Uh, first question. So, uh, Dr. Duran's most recent update indicated that 20% of fifth graders scored below grade level on the reading assessment. Additionally, we have students that are struggling to catch up at all grade levels post pandemic. What intervention would you recommend to address these critical learning issues? And we'll start off with Miranda. I think that's a really important question. And I first want to say, that the 20% of fifth graders this year is a very similar to the 20% of fifth graders last year who were showing on the APS dashboard as needing intensive reading support as they were graduating fifth grade and moving on to sixth grade. So those people presumably are still in sixth grade and they need support as well. And the reason I know that is because there is a dashboard, the academic data out um, that APS published and that I personally advocated for making public so that Parents and community members and anyone who is concerned about this can go and look at the data themselves so that we can understand where we need to target our resources. 
And that's what very robust. And I mentioned this because it's low by a school, they go by demographic population. And if you have the data, one can see the certain schools need a lot more support. And so the demographic groups are part of them. It is a lack of craft students, it is our students with disabilities who are not doing as well currently in reading, and it also extends to math. So what would I do about it? I think number one, you have to identify the problem. And I give credit to Dr. Duran, you know, through his email, he set the problem out there. I think that is a change in tone, and I think it's appropriate and welcome because if we don't know where our issues lie, we can't start to solve them. Second, I think we need more regular monitoring, and we need to understand what is the reasonable expectation with the resources that we have to start closing these gaps. How much progress should we expect over time? How fast can we move? And what resources can we have in order to move more quickly so that we're not graduating students who are functionally illiterate? So with all of that said, I do think there is a need to put budget resources towards the interventionists and to give our teachers the support that they need to support students who are behind and allow our teachers to differentiate more effectively in a classroom setting. We need more budget for interventionists. We need smaller class sizes for our teachers. We generally need to put a budget priority on more classes. Well, that's a very important question. And as we emerge from this pandemic, we are seeing a lot of loss. We had significant loss of life in 2020 and 2021. A lot of students experienced a lot of trauma in many different forms. And what we need to recognize first, I think, is the whole student. And the fact of the matter is, um, I think our students are very highly achieved in one area, which is surviving a pandemic. And that ought to be recognized. Um, the truth of the matter is, um, this, uh, as we go through the current budget process, the superintendent proposed budget and as the school board works through their responses and their proposal on it, um, we are funding more math interventions. We are funding uh, more supports um, to address these kinds of uh, loss. And I don't think, uh, on my part as a school board candidate, I don't think it's my role to second guess every decision. Um, the truth of the matter is, this school board does recognize what's going on with uh, uh, students falling behind. Um, and we do have to uh, continue to persistently focus on opportunity gaps along demographic lines, along socioeconomic lines. Um, I think the superintendent's proposed budget moves us strongly in that direction, and I strongly support it. Um, and uh, uh, the truth of the matter is uh, specificity in data will result in specificity in solutions. We are seeing data, as Marine does alluded to, um, that indicates uh, where these gaps are along demographic lines. And as we continue to move forward through this current budget process, the future budget processes, um, we're going to be able to really pinpoint exactly what we need to be funded. Um, and that's what I suppose as well. It's not so much for a bottle, it's a follow on. I think Angelo is correct to identify mental health as well as um, <laughs> correct to identify mental health as a problem that often will stage any ability to learn and therapy and stuff. Struggling, then you need to get that right before you would be able to resolve content. This year's budget is doing a lot to put more funding towards mental health. I think that's important. APS is not profit, so that's the 34 interventions. This budget will four to the existing six that we have by way of a grant to expire. We need to do that. All right, thank you so much, folks. All right, second question. This will go to you first, Angela. Uh, APS faces a $40 million funding deficit in the coming years. Name three areas where you would propose cuts and three areas that would be priorities for investment. Yeah, so um, I'm aware of the uh, problems we have with balancing the budget. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I don't take a scarcity mentality with our public schools who we can and cannot fund. Um, so, first and foremost, um, I think the county board can be doing more to fund. Uh, APS. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll hear described, uh, uh, I believe it's a 47% split right now of dollars raised in Arlington that go to the public school, uh, which would sort of implies that 47% of the budget is going to the Arlington public schools. 
but this is only counting locally raised revenues. When you look at total budget expenditure, it's more like 36 percent. Um, and so, in that sense, I think that's a little bit of funny money that you can uh, improve on that. Um, so, like I said, I'm not going to uh, talk about what I'm going to hack and cut away. Uh, I'm not a fiscal conservative. I'm fiscally responsible, but we need to be supporting uh, our public students, supporting our students and teachers, particularly as we emerge from this pandemic. And I, we need our county board and our uh, delegation to Richmond to get creative, particularly as federal support subsides from the pandemic to close these gaps, help us close these gaps. And, and I will collaborate with that on where we can uh, uh, make certain spending priorities more sensible uh, and where we can get more funding. Um, now, it has generally been the disposition of some that the central office in SIFAX is too many resources compared to in person or in class uh, uh, expenditures. And that's where I would look first and foremost to make cuts. And I think many folks would agree with that. Um, key priorities for me in funding that are inviolable supporting our educators, including step increases. This year, we don't even have a step increase that meets inflation. We got to do better than that. We also need to fund mental health supports again as we emerge from this pandemic. Um, and these are things that I would consider to be on such a path. Um, thank you. Let me start by first saying what I would mean, not do, because I think the easiest thing to do to address the budget shortfall is turn the dial on class sizes. Turn it up and then the budget balances more readily and the class sizes are bigger. I would not do that. I still want to prioritize small class sizes. I also think it's very easy to take from teachers. A couple of years ago, we had to pay for rental leave. We got to pay by the environment and we just it. I think that those are not the right approaches. What I want to do is first take a look, which we should be doing anyway, at the staff who are not directly in front of our students, our teachers, our support staff, our assistants, our intervention. I do think that we need to prioritize those folks over side facts and we want to be looking at administrators to the extent we can in order to make any needed. The second thing is currently HPS has uh, put into place a policy that gives an additional 18 days of paid holiday leave for 12 month employees. 12 month employees are administrators, generally speaking, and they are now getting an additional 18 days. You can also call work month paid leave on top of their regular paid leave and on top of their regular federal holidays. The teachers are not getting this for 10 months. It is both unfair, but it has to have a cost. APS hasn't calculated it, but I will look there to see that cost. And it's also being driven very directly in this budget here because the APS is asking for an additional FTE in our contract procurement office because the contract's office is going to work. So you can see that this policy with the holidays is having some not on effects, and I think it's important to see that. Third, I think we need an independent audit function to identify things like the holiday leave policy and other areas where we are not use our resources wisely. So I think there's three things, and then I have three more things, which I don't have time for, but I do think that we should focus on bringing a grant writer into APS to draw in additional money to the system from outside sources. Our reason up here is now this, so we can also that would be a good use of FTE. Uh, and then the trade again, and we support that and find more resources to the other end. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, what are your plans to deal with the fentanyl crisis in our schools? I'm very glad you asked this question. This has been an issue which has come in many ways to dominate the school. I know we all know about the uh, horrible overdose at uh, Wakefield High School. We lost Sergio Flores in February when this campaign got started. I'm glad to see the Wakefield PTSA President Judith Davis say thank you. Um, the truth of the matter is, uh, the response to this, again, has to have the specificity of what the issue is. Uh, we are dealing with a challenge of mental health, a massively interrelated challenge in substance abuse. Um, so I have a plan, uh, you can find it on my website, angelaforarlington.com forward slash substance abuse, uh, to bring on more substance abuse staff. And we have an ability in this area, uh, in terms of our uh, budget, to really dramatically increase um, how many substance abuse counties we have. We have a dual pipeline issue as well that uh, needs to be addressed, but I would collaborate with my friends in the county board, and I am friends with our county board, just 
Um, and uh, the truth of the matter is, um, um, our, oh, yes. Um, at a recent uh, school board first session, we had a substance abuse counselor who uh, told the school board uh, she has a workload of about 25 middle schoolers every single solitary week that she sees. Those students cannot be well served by that, as my friend Christina Diaz Board noted in that year. And we need to get those caseloads down so that these can be manageable because clearly we are failing to reach students who are in crisis. So my plan really centers around substance abuse counselors, um, and that's an appropriate and targeted response to the challenges. So this is one of the challenging issues that our agency confronts, um, and it really did come home um, in quite a tragic way this past year. Um, but I want to acknowledge first that, that parents were reading among us about this issue before the tragedy that happened happened. And I think it is important to acknowledge that, but I also think it's important to think about what that means. Parents were making a lot of and we're not getting an appropriate response. I think yes, and I do think that that is something we need to look at from the standpoint of our engagement with the community and our receptiveness to hearings and hearing. Even if it is not always the best, it is important to figure out the problem. As I said, we have a first answer to identify what it is, to figure out the scope, and to come up with a plan that everyone can be involved in this itself. So, in terms of what to actually do, I think that um, one thing that is an immediate need is to figure out how to address issues in our school that allow the sort of things to happen in the schools. And we were in, you know, if there is revenue to the bathroom, perhaps we have a bathroom suite, which is something we don't make time in schools. If there are issues with stairwell, perhaps we live with that. If there are students coming into the school building who are not authorized to be there, we need to make sure the cameras turn and wipe away and face the doors. And for all the things that are very on the ground, granular, and dangerous. Going forward, APS needs to go to more resources and mental health counselors who don't need to stay back in the community and substance abuse counselors. Both of which are very important and that is the issue in this And then finally, we submitted a path to the school or the community work session. We had just talked about how they are implementing a pilot program to put substance abuse counselors from the county into the school. That's where the need is, so we need to carry this to access and prepare it as needed, and it shows support from the county. We're going forward with additional support from the township and collaboration. Thank you so much. All right. Next question is our attendance. Uh, attendance in class has become a major issue, especially at the high school level. As a teacher, I see firsthand how often students miss class. Attendance cannot be taken into account for grades. And disciplinary consequences are weak. What specific policies would you propose to ensure students are present in class to get the education they deserve? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, it's really important to hear from teachers who are actually in the classroom encountering these issues. And I think to, just to say that out front, you know, the school board needs to listen to teachers. And I think that folks have raised concerns that APS sometimes uh, tends to not provide effective platforms uh, for teachers to respond. So I do think it's important to get that perspective, and that's something that I would look for more as a school board member. In terms of the actual in-class environment, this is something that actually goes towards the mental health crisis and the substance abuse issues that we see. If a kid is in class, they're where they're supposed to be. If they're not in class, they're going to be in any number of things. We can all agree are not suitable for students. So I do think that we need to have a policy, and I think we need to have consequences for cutting class and for sending school that are both knowable, ascertainable, clear, fair, and that the enforcement is going to fall in the next one. Just because they do not do more of the things. Um, the time really needs to come from the top within the school, and I think from the top within APS. And I also believe that this relates to expectations for our students. 
continue to source who is valuable, then we can give push around attendance coming out of Dr. Brown's office here in order to remind everyone who is very important. So there have to be uh there, there, we ought to be moving towards enforcing the consequences on this issue to ensure that our students are very exposed. Um, so I have to uh, issue this uh, question. I have to look at the specific data to see if there actually is in the data um, increase. Um, it's very important not to do it by anecdotal to do a lot of data. Um, now, the, the truth of the matter is the response to truancy, we need to have commensurate, uh, reliable, and enforced. Uh, responses when this occurs. The reliability and the, the level of consequence will result in greater compliance. We need to design policies in a way that we can comply with. Um, do I think a disciplinary crackdown on students who are experiencing great mental health challenges and challenges like substance abuse? Do I think that's the appropriate response? No, I do not. It's very important that we um, continue with our uh, the restorative justice policies adopted by the school board that is led on, um, and I would support that. Uh, and so, a measured approach focused specifically on what the problem is, and data driven at its core is what is going to solve uh, this challenge. Um, and I'm a very big fan of evidence based policy making. We do not go off of evidence, we go off of rules. That's why, as I mentioned, I'd like to see specific data on this subject to give a better and more complete response. Um, but I appreciate your question very much. I have more time to So, in addition, I, I mentioned that I think that the policy should be fair, and I think that's very important to pay attention to that. What that has to mean. We currently track in six months sentence. Um, the data that is available to the public is outdated. Did that. But in terms of um, truancy and cutting classes, we need to be monitoring that to make sure that it's fairly applied and that you're not getting this uh, history out of this across any of the groups or country, um, because that is a key measure of parents buying each Okay, next question. Uh, you both sound involved with Arlington Public Schools. Please give us details of your specific work with Arlington Public Schools. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to give you two before. I sit on the APS School Health Advisory Board. Uh, uh, I'll start there. We uh, worked um, recently on um, that particular focus. The overall board has advocated uh, uh, their current focus right now is in the way to the day policy for high school students for things that have been used. And um, I actually have to uh, make a note of this in general position of the School Health Advisory Board on this. They advocated the devices be completely away from the NHS general and identical policy elementary and middle schools. The truth of the matter is, um, as students get older, they're endowed with greater rights and greater responsibilities to exercise those rights um, in the classroom. Uh, I think uh, there's probably a necessity for a countywide policy on cell phones. I don't think an identical policy to go around middle schools is warranted or commensurate at the high school level. Um, but that's an issue that the school health advisory board and our work is very small. Um, I've been a recent addition to the early childhood advisory committee um, and have been pouring through the data there. I have a, uh, I come to that advisory committee with a background um, throughout college as a uh, child care provider in Rockland, Montgomery County, uh, up into the pandemic. Um, and finally, I'm doing uh, work right now on the systemic change work group of the uh, county street security coalition, working on issues um, like access, equitable access to food uh, in the public schools, food policies like free school meals, uh, community eligibility program, which the Biden administration has just made a great expansion on, which will really impact uh, APS students in very positive ways, uh, taking up. Uh, the number of schools that currently do get uh, completed through school meals in the term. So that's a sample of the work that I've done with APS. 
and then cut off this. Thank you. I think this is an important test. I've been an APS parent since 2015. I was a volunteer leader in my daughter's kindergarten class back then when she was with her. Um, I had three kids there who were through elementary, that's the Montessori program, and through the South Africa boundary team. I was involved in advocating around the boundary team in 2018, where I met with a number of school board members to try to get a fair boundary drawn that would um, balance demographics and be fair to our school community and our neighborhood community that had been working for this for some time. I'm still involved on the Green PTA, even though my daughter lives through uh, from uh, during this pandemic in favor of the university school option. She is now re enrolled to attend her class in the fall. Uh, and I have two students at the Montessori uh, Public School of I also um, am the, uh, I am on the Red College of Education Committee, and I've been on that for a couple of years. Uh, and I've been advocating for students within APS, meeting with Dr. Devon, uh, advocating with school board members, meeting with county board members to try to start to discuss things where the county and the schools can collaborate a little bit more. Um, I've also advocated for students around things other than academic students. I advocated for uh, expanded meal pickup sites because the students in my neighborhood were not able to access meals because they didn't cross the road and they were left home alone uh, during virtual learning and they were only one in the school. So I have um, been involved for several years. I've also been involved in preparing to serve on the school board. I'm starting to think forward about how we can collaborate more with the county, how we can work with the school board and only and building a good relationship on the issue. Okay, next question. Uh, what can we do to attract and retain high quality educators in schools like Drew Elementary that has about a high population of students of color and students with free or reduced funds? Please address. The disparity between North and South Island. Um, so, that question really has two parts. <laughs> that question really has two parts. Um, there is the recruiting of quality teachers, and then there's the question about the demographics of certain of our elementary schools. Those are really don't always have anything to do with one another. Who is excellent? I know that as a teacher. And I know that because they had a rock star principal who now works in central office and then another rock star principal on anchor. And when you have a great principal, people want to come and work with them. And it was absolutely disturbing that we got when we were working on the revised boundaries for good and it continued to. I know of students and those, you know, not going to be disturbed in other people, of course. I know of teachers whose children went into the crew who said, the future here are top quality. They are at least as good as not better. And so you can really add an arrow on it. So I do think that it's important to not mix those concepts up. Um, in terms of recruiting in the future, we need to pay them competitively, we need to provide competitive benefits, and I think that we need to respect their looks and we need to bring it to the table more often and uh, utilize the teachers who want to come forward to our students and really listen to them and do our best to address them. In terms of the demographics of APS elementary schools, it is the case that there are a lot of disparities between a low, uh, schools with a higher proportion of lower income students and schools with uh, a small proportion of lower students. That's our need. That's sort of where people live, and there is no silver bullet. And it's important if we are ever looking to redo a boundary to keep in mind demographics and try to get those parents to do what we can, but our neighborhood schools are really valuable. And they build strong communities. And I want to keep that in mind here. It's also important to approach them with an equitable lens. And so, to the extent we do have schools that have more challenges or they need more resources, it might cost to direct the resources in that direction. So, this is a very, very good question. Um, let me start off uh, by being very clear. I will be the most pro teacher pro-union school board member APS has ever seen. Um, there is an old adage that I think is uh, only better appropriate to this question, which is folks do not quit jobs, they quit teachers. And the truth of the matter is we need our teachers and their voice to be listened to. I like it when workers speak up. I like it when they're heard. 
Um, so that's number one. Number two, it is a compensation issue. As we noted, this, uh, uh, as I've noted, in this uh, proposed uh, budget for the forthcoming fiscal year, we are not meeting inflation in the pay raise for gifted teachers. So it's in effect a pay cut. Um, and that's unacceptable. And that would be one of my top priorities in the school. Another top priority of mine is 12 weeks of paid family leave. In one of the wealthiest counties in the United States of America, we can afford to fund this for our teachers. And it's right in line with the Biden Harris Democratic agenda. I will tell you how many weeks I'll provide. I'll tell you how much it'll cost, and I'll tell you how I'll pay for it. It's not a platitude, it's a plan. I'm not doing anything. Um, now, as it relates to uh, disparities, I think a key priority that we have to have. Um, that I did not hear my opponent mention actually is staff diversity. Students feel more supported and um, more enabled to develop a love for learning when their teachers look like them. And that has to be an absolute priority. Um, and that would be one of my priorities in staff recruitment to develop that staff diversity. I had a great conversation before I announced my campaign with Emma Leolin Sanchez, a former school board member about grow your own programs. And I'd like to work more in that area on this group. All right, next question. The community put a lot of time, energy, and resources in the report and recommendations to remove SROs. What is your position on SROs? This um, conversation has largely reemerged, resurfaced as the result of the death of Sergio Flores at the end of last year. Let me be clear. I will be a solid brick wall against any attempt to put SROs back into schools. I will be unequivocal on this point. The community did have a process, a long and fairly drawn out process to remove the SROs from the schools. Um, for those who would advocate we put them back, I sure hope we intend to have the same long, thoughtful, judicious process to make that choice. Um, the, the truth of the matter is, in responding to the substance abuse crisis, that would not be an appropriate response. I have yet to hear someone articulate to me how exactly an SRO sitting next to the principal's office would have changed any facts in that situation. That's why I have a plan to bring on more substance abuse counselors to directly respond to the challenges students are facing. We're bringing more supports that bring in more counselors um, in general for the mental health of students. These students have done an incredible thing, which is survive the pandemic. And now we are seeing the reverberations of the challenges from that pandemic. Um, we're seeing uh, just recently a, a horrible report from the CDC detailing uh, spikes in depression and anxiety among them, particularly among girls. And in order to address these challenges, we need to have uh, the specificity in our solutions of the specificity of the problem. And responding with the bluntest, simplest object available to us, it's rarely a real solution. That is my position on the SROs. Thank you, SROs are important. Uh, I am aware, and it's my perspective, public color that I'm being aware, is that when you want to find a police officer, you have different rights. And that's doubly true for children. I would not be able to go to children to speak with a police officer outside of my presence, and I'm not comfortable with that in our schools. All of that said, we need to address the safety issue in our schools. I do not think that bringing back SROs is the correct answer at present. It's also not a possible answer at present. The chief of the Army County Police Department will listen to what they said. They say at least 18 months we can move to build back that capacity. We don't have that kind of time. But what we do have are school safety coordinators. They're in our schools now. There is a plan to add more of them to the budget. But we need a plan for what they are supposed to do and an ability to understand how they're being trained, understand what they are actually doing, and see where. We need to continue to work on our school security um, program overall. When we move the SROs, I'm not confident we have a strong plan, and there may have been a bit of a reaction there. And that, that's not something that's going forward. We need to ensure security and safety of our students in our schools. 
And then the last thing I'll say on the SRO question is we do go through a community process. And one of the things that was identified was we got the SROs to move them from the schools would um, help us with some of the disparate impacts we're seeing among our student populations in terms of rape and suspension and other disciplinary actions. We need to continue to track that data. Currently, the APS Equity Dashboard has published school suspension data, but it has not been updated since 2020. We need that data as well to see whether our solution had the intended effect, and if it did not, what else do we need to be doing to address different disciplinary actions in schools? Um, I appreciate my point of mentioning uh, school security coordinators. Um, this was the response to getting SROs out of school to put these uh, unarmed professionals in their place. And that's what this school board did. And I don't think it's my role as a candidate to second guess everything we did. Um, I do have a slight, slight issue with the superintendent's proposed budget, which is that it allocates four times as many school security coordinators as it does substance abuse counselors. I will say once again, if we are going to respond to specific challenges, we must have uh, specific solutions that address those problems. So I'd support a more even balance. It's about eight, uh, either seven or eight new school security coordinators to two substance abuse counselors. I support a more even balance. All right, next question. What is your understanding of restorative justice and do you support it? Restorative justice in schools? Yes, yeah, so this has been one of the great accomplishments of this school board of my friend Reed Goldstein's tenure as well. Um, APS has led the way in moving us um, toward policies that reduce harm, that do not perpetuate cycles of violence, cycles of um, uh, student behavior challenges. Um, and the truth of the matter is um, uh, we need to continue doing that. And I favor uh, uh, just the progress that has been made on things like positive behavior interventions and supports, not uh, filtering students through the school or prison pipeline and these adversarial um, criminal justice style systems. Um, this is progress. Um, and I support that progress and we need to keep the ball rolling forward. I had, uh, I had the opportunity this week uh, to speak with to sit down with somebody who's deeply involved in the sort of Arlington and, and be able to learn more about how it is being implemented. And I am supportive of, of the efforts in the program. I think it is a little bit more than is often conveyed. It really feeds into community building as well within a classroom, within a school, and getting students invested in their own community so that they are supportive of their own community and so that they are, you know, championing. The right thing to do and making sure that they you know are bought into the system. So I think that that aspect of restorative really plays in very well with our students' mental health and social emotional needs currently. I think also that restorative does have an accountability piece to it, and that's often less talked about. So if we're quite too or more concerned potentially about restorative justice being juxtaposed against you know more traditional. Um, disciplinary style or even the criminal justice system, one thing that maybe we could do going forward is to communicate more clearly about how restorative is played out in APS schools, what it means, and what the accountability um, approaches are, because it does it does include a form of accountability, and I think that's very important for our students to see the results of their actions and the consequences and to be able to take that in and, and respond appropriately. Uh, we see lots of data about test scores. What are alternative, more meaningful measures of student achievement uh, that the school board should consider? That is a great question because the emphasis in the on test scores and assessments is the thing that the academic dashboard um, presents. And I'm a big fan of the academic dashboard, but there is a lot more. One thing that I would love to see APS focus on is writing. I think that writing is something that has been overlooked recently, and there are surveys that I believe is the English Language Arts Committee within ACTL, the Advisory Council on Teaching and Learning, that put out a survey 
of recent APS high school graduates who have gone on to college. And the results reflected that many of them do not feel well prepared for college writing. So I think that we should be bringing a stronger focus to writing and trying to put more assignments like that into our classroom. We know the IB program does this very well. Um, the IB program is at Washington Liberty and it's at Jefferson, um, but we can draw that context from that for all of our schools. We can even draw concepts for that for the Career Center in Arlington Tech as we move forward in trying to imagine and design what those schools look like because there is in fact an IB CPT program. And all of these things surround rigor with respect to writing, which I think is a more qualitative way to show what you know. And it's also extremely valuable for students to be able to organize their thoughts and present them clearly. Um, I'm a big fan of writing, perhaps I'm biased because I'm a lawyer, um, but I think that, <laughs> that should be a stronger focus. Um, I'm going to leave that. <laughs> Um, well, the truth of the matter is standardized test scores are not everything. I think we as Democrats in particular understand the um, uh, challenges with a, uh, the inherent problems on the face of having a uh, disproportionate focus on standardized test scores. Um, I think there are many ways to show, uh, for, for students to show what they know, uh, to have these pathways to success in education. Um, I, I actually will add on to my opponent's uh, comments about uh, a greater focus on writing. I think an iterative process and, and leading more with these kinds of uh, writing assignments can allow students to uh, show very clearly in their own words with uh, subjects they're particularly interested in, uh, what they know on any given subject. Um, and so uh, I think it's very important to uh, lean away from having too heavy of a focus on uh, what their standardized test scores are, what their SOL scores are, um, and, and keeping that uh, balance is very important. Would you call for an, an, an auditor of our public schools? <laughs> yeah, I, I know this is a, a big priority of my opponents. Um, I'm open to the idea. Um, I'd like to uh, hear more from the community about it, hear more from APS staff about it. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, look more at the information we have available about its benefits, about its drawbacks. Um, I think being judicious in any expenditure um, in any uh, uh, allocation of new positions in any reformatting of current positions is very important. Um, and so I would take a uh, cautious approach with this issue. Um, I won't commit to supporting an independent auditor at this time. I do understand there are some reported benefits of it, um, and, and I'd like to uh, keep that conversation going. Yes, is the answer, um, which you all predicted. So I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about why I think it matters. First of all, the county board has an independent auditor. So that is an example right here in Arlington uh, that I think that we should mirror. Uh, second of all, APS had an auditor um, until very recently. And one of the things the auditor identified was how APS spent its COVID federally authorized recovery money. Um, and one of the large expenditures of APS was on a virtual learning program that did not uh, produce very good results and was actually ended uh, midway through the school year. It cost a lot of money. It was over $11 million. And it, Arlington Public Schools only got about $18 million out of our COVID relief funds. The independent auditor did a report on this. And I think that shining a light on that sort of thing is one of the very important things the auditor does. The auditor has since resigned uh, because the terms of his employment letter were not consistent with best practices according to the risk professional standards. Um, so I do think that we need to look very hard about what the auditors do and why they are important. I've already touched on the holiday issue and then we can hammer it again, but the reality is we have a large expenditure on paid leave and we have not accurately, we have not calculated at all. Uh, how much it will cost in yes, that can be a function of an auditor as well. So I do very much support the goal. We have an $83 million budget, and I think it's very important 
be using those funds wisely and responsibly and, and to be able to tell the community we are doing right with our budget, we are doing right by our teachers, we are spending the money where it should be spent. What specific measures will you take to improve uh, transparency and communication by Arlington Public Schools and the school board? So recently, Arl now published a document that was a school board document created in January of this year that uh, provided some guidance around how school board members ought to engage the public and how they ought to engage the and one of the things that document said was engaging with the public and should be paid. I don't agree with that. I would not do that. I'm not a very paid person, so I don't know you that uh, I've been with you for several months. Um, so that's a problem. I think it's important to interact with the community. I think mean, it's important to say what you think. Absolutely, you should be your board member. It is only one board member, but they're an elected official. And the way you're accountable to the public. By being elected, Dr. Duran is not elected. He is less directly accountable to the public. School board members are. The second thing that Dr. has said was school board members should not, during this time of uncertainty around collective bargaining, either they should not talk to our teachers or even listen. That is another thing that I don't agree with. I think it's very important to listen to our teachers because they have the perspective that those of us sitting on the school board and those folks sitting in Sunfax, where they work very hard, don't have because they are not in the school setting on a daily basis in the classroom. So I think that listening to teachers and um, perhaps empowering the teachers' council on instruction with a little bit more authority, making sure they're in slot on significant things that affect teachers, those are things that I would prioritize in Twitter. Um, so this is a very good question. Um, the truth of the matter is our current advisory board ecosystem is uh, generally unrepresented part of So it mirrors uh, parallels broader public engagement processes in Arlington. I think we all saw how like, that county boardroom got filled up with um, components of the missing middle issue that were actually dramatically in the minority. Um, the truth of the matter is I think part of the solution here involves um, taking uh, the recommendations of groups that are unrepresentative of the community with a grain of salt in the understanding that this is not representative for the other um, Furthermore, we need to actively be uh, proactively trying to be reaching the needs for knowledge. I think APS should fully across the school system and uh, bilingualism, for instance. Um, and I, I do also want to respond to my opponent's comments about the. Uh, uh, she's talking about the How We Work document drafted by the current chair of the school board, uh, my friend Nick Goldstein. Um, the truth of the matter is, uh, she got a lot of things right about it. There was also some mischaracterizations. Um, it was a poorly phrased document in a number of ways. And I do want to be clear I will be the most pro union, pro teacher member of the school board in its history. Um, I'm a big fan of workers speaking up and being heard. Um, the truth of the matter is, uh, some of the comments that were made in that document refer to one board member uh, attempting to speak for the board, um, basically cautioning, do not do this um, when you are talking about the broader positions of the board. Make sure you are not speaking. Um, and uh, another point about that document is. Uh, the document refers to speaking to teachers. It involves direct employment disputes. Uh, in terms of saying those discussions uh, should not happen, but should, should be referred to the appropriate MDS staff. All right, thank you so much. This may be our last question. Um, what's, and we had so many great questions today, so thank you for everyone. Wrote questions if I did not get to your question. To apologize. Um, what specific areas do you see for more collaboration with the county to support students and working families? Have you really foster relationships and work on these issues? Right. So I think the question is by collaboration between schools and the county work. Um, 
Um, so I have great relationships with all of our school board members and all of our council members. I have been a rich builder um, that has been a reputation of throughout the years of involving me to schools, teachers, and political and community activists. Um, and they like me. I can work with them very well. From day one, in that sense, I'd be an effective school board member. Um, all of my bridges are intact. Um, and I have a couple of areas where we can support working families of all. Um, uh, an enormous outside portion of my agenda is about supporting working APS families, much like I was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and my number one priority in that area is school meals. This is something, this is a, uh, this legislation that we had carried in Richmond by uh, Delegate Dan Caron and Mike Mullen, a great piece of legislation killed by Republicans on a party line vote. Um, this is an area where we've seen recently action by the Biden administration to take the community eligibility program threshold down from 40% uh, of students receiving free and reduced lunch will qualify next school for free and uh, for free lunch, 25%, greatly expanding uh, the amount of students receiving that without uh, cost. So this is uh, the number one area where we will have opportunity for collaboration with the county board to find the funding for this. And by the way, due to the Biden administration's recent action, that takes the price tag for Arlington down dramatically. Um, another area uh, we could find for collaboration is supporting our educators. 12 weeks of paid family leave is a top line priority for the Democratic Party, uh, for the Biden Harris administration, Democrats in Richmond. And we can uh, enact that in Arlington, one of the wealthiest school districts in the nation. And that's an area for collaboration in the county board as well. Um, and I also believe the crisis in student mental health, uh, probably my third foremost priority. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to work with the county, uh, particularly as we're seeing limited resources at the moment to increase education. So the three main areas where the county and schools can collaborate pretty effectively, I hope. Uh, the first is around summer school. I think that we should be looking to expand summer school. Currently, we're serving fewer students than we served before the pandemic. That alone should be a little bit concerning given the COVID requirements. So, we can hopefully expand summer school. The county can assist with funding for that and with the patients for that. Uh, another thing about summer school, which I think potentially the county could be doing, is bringing back more of an enrichment approach to summer school. So, it's not just the media. Public schools, summer school, all of that, from an equity standpoint, we have to offer really excellent, top notch. Competitive, but also enriching public alternatives for our students in communities where they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford these opportunities. And the summer school is a key way that we can do that with support from the county. Second thing is literacy school. We have an organization here called Friends of Arlington Library. And we have an outstanding public library system. These resources are available to a six year students who may struggle with reading and just need someone to read with them. When I was in my first job in Arlington Law School, we had a reading list. My employer supported all of us reading once a day, once a week, once a month, whatever, going into a public school and reading with each other. Because sometimes we just need somebody to read with them. I didn't have any particular training. I just wanted to spend time with kids and you know me. Sometimes that's all it takes. And we have a lot of folks in this community who go to our libraries, go to you know, other avenues to support our students who need it. Finally, mental health. Um, I touched on this before, but I think it's important to bring the resources to where the problem is. And DHS is working on that, and I think that's fantastic. Another example of a community organization that does just that is the organization for the uh, support organization for after school and everything in the called Aspire. They are located near Carlton Springs, they're located in the best end of the head, it's exactly where they should be so that they can maximize serving their students. All right, big round of applause to our contenders today. Thank you, Chairman of the Green Board. And a big round of applause to our time today, Paul Ruiz. Now, I want to thank the director of community medicine, that person for whom we are deeply grateful as part of this committee. Thank you, Paul, for filling uh, in today. All right, so without any further ado, we are going to go to closing statements. And the first person to give their closing statements, we keep the same order. 